This is Sigmund Bauman. His life was punctuated by successive threats. Initially, he was threatened by social prejudice. He was then introduced to the threats of poverty and hunger. Finally, he was thrown into the threats of violence in a deadly battlefield. Surviving these perils, he proposed a difficult challenge to himself to understand how collective life is organized, its main features, problems, and yes, its threats. In the course of this life story, he never ceased to look for new knowledge, which made him be a constant partner to books, papers, and newspapers. Eventually, he summarized his experiences and knowledge in the form of an explanation that reveals the mechanisms of culture, economy, and society. Sigmund Bauman was a sociologist. Sigmund Bauman was born in 1925 in the city of Poznan in Poland. His parents belonged to the low middle class. His father was a businessman and seller. Sigmund had an older sister. In his childhood, Sigmund discovered the hardships of social prejudice, being the member of a Jewish family in an environment where anti-Semitic rage was spreading. The feeling of being targeted was intensified by the proximity of Germany, which was then the main source of rage against Jews. In the family, Sigmund's father was the main target of prejudices. His economic situation was gradually jeopardized as his shop suffered from the boycott to businesses led by Jewish people. Under these social and economic pressures, Sigmund's father once tried to suicide jumping into a river but was saved by police officers. For Sigmund, life was also hard, as he suffered much prejudice in the school where he belonged to the minority of Jewish students. As a consequence, he became a lonely boy who spent most of his time reading books and learning the piano. To his relief, he discovered the Hashomer Hatzer, a group of young Jewish people where he was received in a friendly way. When Sigmund was 13 years old, Poznan was bombarded and invaded by the German Nazis. The family was then under a very serious threat. Overnight, the father managed to put everybody in a train that advanced literally in the middle of bombs and bullets. They managed to cross the border, continuing the risky journey by carriage, horse and by walking. In 1939, the family arrived at Belarus, 
where Zygmunt would discover a completely new social milieu. Zygmunt encountered a new social environment. There was little prejudice and inequalities, including little differences between men and women. However, the comfortable life of middle class had also been left behind. Living out of precarious and improvised jobs, the family struggled to make ends meet. This was the time when Zygmunt first joined a communist organization. At the same time, he worked as a volunteer in a library, which enabled him to access several books to read. In 1941, when the family was getting used to the new context, the Nazis invaded Belarus, obliging them to flee to the Soviet Union. Initially, Zygmunt found a job in a railway station, thus helping his parents to face the hard economic situation. At that moment, Life in society had proved too complicated and dangerous for the young Zygmunt. Perhaps as a form of escapism, he became interested in the sky and the outer space, where everything seemed to be quieter and less dangerous. He dreamt of studying cosmology and becoming an astronaut. physics course at the University of Gorky. The Soviet Union did not allow the presence of immigrants in big cities, which obliged Zygmunt to follow his course by post. The family moved to the city of Vakten, where Zygmunt worked as a mathematics teacher. He also found another library where he worked as a volunteer. Still a lonely young man, he spent long hours in the library, whose vast collection included even books that had been forbidden by Stalin. In 1943, the Soviet army called Zygmunt to Moscow. He joined the Department of Traffic Control. 
When he was 18 years old, he volunteered to join the Polish branch of the Soviet army. With some technical knowledge and able to speak both Russian and Polish, Zygmunt quickly ascended to leading military positions. In 1944, with the escalation of the conflicts, Zygmunt had to leave the administrative work and was sent to the front in Ukraine. He then participated in the military advancement to the West, retracing the way followed by his family in the previous years, helping to liberate a thread of cities dominated by the Nazis. Still in 1944, he arrived at the borders with Poland, his home country. In the Polish city of Lublin, he saw the remnants of a concentration camp, with Jewish people's dead bodies piling up. He also participated in the conquest of Warsaw. In March 1945, in a battle against the Nazis in North Poland, Zygmunt received a shot in the shoulder blade. Covered in sweat and blood, he was taken to an improvised hospital where he received precarious health care. More than ever before, his life was under serious risk. <laughs> Jak noc, która po to jest, by słońce mogła During the conflicts in Warsaw, the Polish civil population strived to survive in the middle of bombardments, blood and violence. One of these survivors was Janina Lewison, a young lady who escaped the Nazis and ran away along with her mother. In the battlefield hospital, Zygmunt received health care for five weeks. In the meantime, the Nazis were defeated and repelled from Poland. With the end of the war, Zygmunt could once again live in Poland, a country destroyed by the conflicts and swept by misery and internal conflicts. Now much more aware of and interested in social and cultural differences, he began to study sociology at the University of Warsaw. However, the course was cancelled for political reasons and he had to convert his studies into a degree in philosophy. During these studies, Zygmunt met Janina Lewison, the lady who had escaped the Nazis and who would subsequently become Janina Baumann, his wife and mother of his three daughters. In the early 1940s, Zygmunt joined the Polish Unified Workers' Party. Intellectually, he was a follower of traditional Marxism, while in his political life he was a communist. However, he, like so many people in post-war Poland, developed an aversion and critical view towards communism, a regime that was creating inequalities and political oppression in his country. Kto się ośmieli ściągać mnie w dół swoich klakierów zebrałam tłum jedzą mi z ręki spijają z warg rządni wszystkiego co tylko mam głosy sprzeciwu nie liczą się gdy grób jest kurka Siebie dam i 
1954, Sigmund completed a master's degree in philosophy. In the same year, he initiated his PhD and became assistant professor at the University of Warsaw. In 1956 and 1957, he lived in the UK, where he did postdoctoral studies at the London School of Economics. In the 1960s, he dedicated himself to sociology, publishing his first books. In 1968, an international wave of protests and social discontent emerged, especially in universities. In Poland, the student movement ended up reigniting the anti-Semitic sentiment. The Communist Party began to persecute critical people, especially those who also were Jews. Because of his critical stance, Zygmunt was fired from the university and from the party. Once again, he felt threatened, both socially and physically, in his own country. Because of the political pressure and the prejudices, he once again felt obliged to leave Poland. This time, his destination was Israel, where he became a lecturer at the University of Tel Aviv. At that time, his name was emerging in the international academic scenario, being considered as the expression of an outstanding sociological thought. In 1971, he accepted the invitation to become head of the Department of Sociology of the University of Leeds in England. In the 1970s, Sigmund began to publish his books in English, analyzing the capitalist society, its organization in social classes, and the culture it generates. He was still following the Marxist tradition. In the 1980s, he abandoned this approach and realized a postmodernist shift, trying to understand the characteristics of postmodern society. When he retired from the university in the 1990s, some believed that his academic production would fade away. On the contrary, Sigmund became more productive than ever before, publishing more than one book every year. In the year 2000, he showed that his source of sociological inspiration was indeed far from being extinguished, being able to produce very consistent streams of ideas. He published the book called Liquid Modernity, initiating what would become known as the liquid phase of his sociological career. In the book, he argues that social life has become fluid, mobile, chaotic, risky, uncertain, in a word, liquid. In this society marked by individualism and consumerism, traditional institutions lose their force and stability. In these conditions, all human experiences become liquid. It's in this sense that he wrote about liquid love, liquid life, liquid fear, liquid times. With this interpretation, Zygmunt secured his ultimate international reputation, with his ideas being recognized even outside of academic domains and influencing activists in several world regions. He lived in Leeds until his death in 2017, when he was 91 years old. 
After surviving many threats and violent acts in the course of his agitated life, the old sociologist died at home in a peaceful and quiet environment. This is the Vodianoi. His story is told by Slavic people in the vast areas that include Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Ukraine, Russia, and others. The Vodianoi is the spirit of the water. He is a creature that inhabits bodies of water such as lakes, rivers, ponds, and streams. In different accounts, he takes different forms. Sometimes he is depicted as a mixture of man and frog, having a green beard and the skin covered with fish scales. Sometimes he is described as an old man with a long beard. Sometimes he is said to be a creature that takes different forms at different moments. In some countries, like Russia and Poland, the Vodianoi is not a single creature but actually a member of a civilization that lives in deep waters and shelters in crystal palaces. The Vodianoi is a temperamental creature that gets easily angry. At those moments, he can cause floods, break down dams, or provoke storms that would destroy mills. Even worse, his anger can cause him to emerge from the water to attack, grab, and drown people. Sometimes, the person is not killed but has a gloomy destiny. If the victim is a man, the Vodianoi can turn him into a slave. If the victim is a woman, the Vodianoi can have children with her. Therefore, people living by the water have strived to appease the Vodianoi by killing animals as offerings to the water creature. People have also looked for ways to keep the Vodianoi at bay. In Ukraine and Russia, for example, it's believed that by burying a horse skull near the water, it's possible to prevent the Vodianoi from approaching people. In Belarus, it's said that black animals, such as cats and goats, would keep the Vodianoi at bay. However, the Vodianoi is not always described as an evil creature. Some people talk about him as a protector of certain bodies of water and even a helper. By taking care of the water, he makes possible for new owners, fishermen and people living by the water to maintain their ways of living. The Vodianoi symbolizes the unstable relation between people and their environment. From the liquid home where he lives, he reminds people that much care is always needed, 
as human life is full of dangers, challenges, and hidden understandings. In 1945, Sigmund Bauman took a boat and headed to a military camp where a cruel battle was raging. He could not know that he was joining his final battle as a shot in the shoulder blade would finally remove him from the war. From time to time, he could hear the noise of machine guns working and bombs exploding in the distance. The signs of war came from everywhere even from the smell that traveled in the air, even from the noise of the wooden paddles cutting the river waters. Nevertheless, Zygmunt was somehow at peace, because he was finally back to his native Poland, in sweet places that he was helping to liberate. He had the impression that fabulous forces were by his side, in such a way that the opponents would eventually be captured and drowned. In that humid late afternoon, on a liquid day of the Polish spring, a legendary beam could be seen. <laughs> 